is the expression of imagination and not the imitation of life. Henry Moore is the most important of living British sculptors. With the strange and impressive shapes that fill his studio, he picks up and carries on a tradition that has been extinct in England for 400 years, a tradition of expressiveness and truth to material. The studio is a workshop in which he turns his ideas into tangible forms. At first sight, this world is unfamiliar and puzzling to us. But the quality and quantity of Moore's work has a unity that could only come from great originality and strength. Sculpture of this kind is a challenge to our accepted ideas, and we must understand the sculptor's approach to his work before we can appreciate the work itself. The sculptor is distinguished from other artists by his materials and by the way he uses them. Here are Henry Moore's hands and his tools. Sculpture is the art of cutting, carving, or modeling various materials, such as the hard crystalline stone on the left or the stringy wood on the right. Stone is worked with chisels, each one giving a characteristic effect. Wood is worked in quite a different way and with different tools. But sculpture can be modeling as well as carving, building up as well as cutting away. And for this, the artist uses clay, wax, or plaster. Henry Moore often works out his ideas for metal figures by making small models in a softer, pliable material before translating them into metal. He has just as complete a command of modeling as he has of carving. This face was carved in stone more than 300 years ago by a great Italian sculptor, Lorenzo Bernini. His immense technical skill made the same piece of stone represent hair, flesh, cloth, and lace. This is a portrait in stone, so wonderfully lifelike that we almost expect to hear it breathe. 400 years of tradition have accustomed us to seek and to expect from sculpture the image of the object that it depicts. Henry Moore's approach is very different from this. His first regard is for the material he uses and the ideas it brings to his mind. We can see through this head and be aware of one part in relation to another because of its open metallic structure. Here is an even more abstract work of wood and string, its smooth polished surface patterned by the grain of the wood. The strings supply contrasting lines of tension suggestive of rigging. Here is the grace of a ship at sea or of a bird in flight. This earlier piece makes its effect solely through the quality of the stone. It is massive, smooth, and secretive. Its creator speaks of its germ-like, nut-like conception, suggesting a hidden power. But let us leave Henry Moore for a moment and look at the work of the other artists working at the time when he was still a student. Here is a picture by Seurat, which shows a new interest in mass and form, as well as a new technique of painting. Here is a portrait by Cezanne. He once said that nature is made from a cube, a cylinder, and a sphere. Picasso is another painter whose example stimulated all his fellow artists. These painters and many others were working in a period of experiment. Henry Moore had made up his mind to be a sculptor from the age of 14. As a student, he was influenced by the writings of the distinguished critic Roger Fry, who rediscovered the beauty of primitive art and showed that the realistic work of the classical and Renaissance traditions represented only a very small part of the total artistic output of the 30,000 year period known to us. Moore left Leeds, where he had been studying, and came to London to continue working as a student and also to get to know the collections of sculpture at the British Museum. Not the figures outside, which represented the Victorian idea of art, but to explore the new world of visual experience inside. Imagine yourself walking around these galleries for the first time, as he did. 
Look at the wonderful things he saw during the many hours he spent there amongst pieces of sculpture created thousands of years and thousands of miles apart, yet all having common characteristics in the language of form. Seeing the sculpture you have just seen, which made it clear to me that the primitive races have a deep sensibility for plastic shapes. Primitive art makes a straightforward statement. Its primary concern is with the elemental, and its simplicity comes from a direct and strong feeling, which is very different from being simple for the sake of being simple, which only leads to emptiness. I think you'll see what I mean if you look at this Mexican pottery figure. It was made by someone with a direct and immediate response to life, to whom art was a channel for expressing strong hopes, beliefs and fears. The central tradition of sculpture is rooted in a primary respect for the materials of sculpture. One can learn from all sorts of natural forms uh, such as these. Take, for instance, this stone. It has a hole right through it. It has a strong, slow, structural rhythm, um, which perhaps shows nature's way of working stone. Very much in contrast to this shell, um, which is a living thin, hollow form, which might give the idea for uh, hollow metal sculpture. Or again, take this bone. Uh, bones have a remarkable structural strength in spite of their thinness. It was studying such natural forms as these, along with the um, human figure, uh, which has been the basis for most of my sculpture. Here are some of Moore's earliest works. Although Mexican sculpture and the work of Picasso were two major influences on his development, drawings like these show that the years he spent studying the human figure, that most subtle and difficult of all subjects, were equally important and he still returns to life drawing from time to time. In this figure of a girl, one's emotions are stirred not by her similarity to real life, so much as by her shape and gesture, and by their identity with the stone in which they are carved. A sculptor like Henry Moore thinks of shape simply as shape, and not as a description or reminiscence of reality. His work has a vitality of its own, which is far more than a reproduction of the vitality of life. Yet his work is not always as remote from the feeling and appearance of the real world as one might suppose. For example, during the war, most of us must have felt something of the artistic experience revealed in these drawings.
The sculptor's drawings are the notes and sketches of ideas for three-dimensional forms. Some of these forms or themes are seen repeated here in these models which have lain about in his studio for years. Some are reminders of his earlier development. Others indicate his more recent ideas and achievements. This last group has now been translated into stone and stands in Battersea Park, London. This group is at St. Matthew's Church in Northampton. Writing about it at the time, Moore said, I began thinking of the Madonna and Child for St. Matthew's, considering in what way a Madonna and Child differs from a mother and child. That is, by considering how, in my opinion, religious art differs from secular art. It is not easy to describe in words what this difference is except to say in general terms that the Madonna and child should have an austerity and a nobility and some touch of grandeur or even aloofness which is missing in the mother and child idea. I have tried to give a sense of complete ease and repose as though the Madonna could stay in that position forever. Other important works followed and you can see some of them here in settings that suit them far better than the artificial atmosphere of a gallery. Moore lives in the country, in this 17th century farmhouse. His name is now world famous. He has had important exhibitions in Paris, Amsterdam and New York. In 1948 he was awarded the International Prize for Sculpture at Venice. In 1950 he was commissioned by the Arts Council of Great Britain to create a piece of sculpture which was first to be shown at the 1951 Festival of Britain. Moore does all his work in this studio. His notebooks provide continuous evidence of the workings of an artist's mind 
and contain the case histories of many of his best known works. In October 1950, he once more took up his notebook and pencil and set down to work out the first ideas for this new figure, uncertain at first of its form, shape or material. He has written about the problem of beginning work on a new subject. He says, I sometimes begin a drawing with no preconceived problem to solve with only the desire to use pencil and paper and make lines, tones and shapes with no conscious aim. But as my mind takes in what is produced, a point arises, and some idea becomes conscious and crystallizes. Then a control and ordering begins to take place. Then I begin consciously to build an ordered relationship of forms which shall express my idea. But if a work is more than a sculptural exercise, unexplainable jumps in the process of thought occur and imagination plays its part. When the drawings were finished, the next thing was to make a model. This was the first large reclining figure Moore had ever done in metal. To begin with, rough experiments were worked out in clay and plasticine. From these, he got the feeling of the whole thing, so that he could eventually go ahead and make a precise miniature exactly to scale. Then came the task of constructing a full-size plaster model. Because of its great size and weight, this needed a strong iron framework to carry the mass of hardened plaster from which the molds could be made for casting the bronze itself. As the plaster grew round the metal skeleton, a new work gradually came to life.
completed model now had to be cast in bronze. At this stage, the skill of the artist depends upon the skill of the craftsman who carry out his intentions. The molds are made in sections which are divided so that they can be lined with wax. When the mold is finished, the wax evaporates in the heat of the kiln, leaving a cavity into which the metal can be poured. The molds must be very firmly packed in sand to allow a gradual and even cooling. The molten bronze is lifted white hot from the furnace. It must be poured quickly before it loses its temperature. And this calls for a precision of eye and deftness of handling that only come with long experience. It is part of a sculptor's trade to be able to conceive his work in forms that can be divided into sections for casting. sections are assembled and riveted together with great care. The joints must be strong enough to bear the weight that will rest on them. When it is finished, even an experienced sculptor would find it hard to discover where one section ends and the next begins. It was spring when the finished figure was returned to Moore's studio. After six months of intensive labor, a new work had been completed. Henry Moore's sculpture is at its best when seen in the light and setting in which it was born. Though this figure was made to be shown first of all on the site of the Festival of Britain exhibition, its subject is in no way connected with that special occasion. The commission that Moore received simply made it possible for him to undertake a work of power, grace and beauty that might not otherwise have been possible. <laughs> 